Can you picture the first goal before the ball's even bounced? You might have the touch. When the weather's wet, can you feel all triumph? You've got the power. Can you read the footy future in the mullet of a full forward? Then you too might be harnessing the power of the touch. Got the touch? Download the Tab Touch app today. You win some, you lose more. For free and confidential support, call 1-800-858-858 or visit gamblinghelponline.org.au. Hello and welcome to Hoop 7's Basketball Hustle and what an NBL Championship Series we're now in the middle of all of a sudden after one of the most incredible finishes to a game we'll ever see, one of the best shots we'll ever see in the NBL, the Tasmania Jack Jumpers. After last week I asked my co-host Cody Ellis if we would even have more games to talk about this week, all of a sudden they're one game away from what would be an incredible NBL Championship, but we still got Melbourne United for them, standing in the way, trying to send it to a Game 5 back in Melbourne. So that's a lot for us to get through on its own. We'll dive into a, a few other things happening across the NBL world as well. But the NBL Championship Series will be our focus this week. We're here, as always, thanks to Hoop7 and Tab Touch, And I'm, once again, delighted to be joined by the former South East Melbourne Phoenix head coach, Simon Mitchell. Simon, good to be with you again. Yeah, glad to be back on your show, Chris. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries at all. Always fa- fascinating to pick your brain. And in the middle of a championship series, I can't wait to see what you're you're seeing between the Jack Jumpers and and Melbourne United. But first of all, we haven't caught up for a, for a little while. Cody's been hogging the the hosting chair. What's the last three or four weeks been like for you? Uh, well, same as what it was every week. Just really busy uh, running the kids around their hoops uh, and trying to stay in touch with the grand final. I uh, actually have only seen one game live so far. I've had mm. to had to miss the other two and watch them on replay. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the start of the AFL season too. Um, at some stage, um, <laughs> calling with when they decide to turn up, and yes. then uh, the AFL season starts for me. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, it's a good time of year. Obviously, we had the WNBL finals, and uh, we've got an amazing, an amazing grand final series underway right here. That uh, has been enthralling, and it's been great watching the games back over and over, trying to trying to see the the changes in um, in strategies during the course of the game, and uh, and see who's winning the uh, who's, who's winning those battles. Yeah, nice of Collingwood to wait until the NBL season's finished for them to to start turning up. <laughs> That's right. They're waiting on the end of the finish. <laughs> um, all right. So a lot of a lot of our show, obviously, this week will be surrounding what we've seen so far, especially in Game Two and Game Three of this championship series, and also looking ahead to Game Four. And I'll leave it to the end of the show to let you tell us if you think it'll be done in Game Four on Thursday night in Hobart, or if we'll be going to a Game Five back in Melbourne. But let's start with the end of Game Three. It's one of the most incredible finishes to an NBL game in, in of any sort but especially a, a grand grand final game so much we could get through i mean some of those big shots in the last three or four minutes were were unbelievable but what everyone was talking about at the end was the last last eight seconds i want to get your thoughts first of all what did you what went through your mind when you saw that inbounds pass from of all people matthew delavadova that just sailed completely over chris golding's head who, who ended up out of bounds and was going out of bounds before Milton Doyle saved it. What did you What did you make of what you saw with that? Yeah, I guess uh, sometimes my, my immediate thought was they stayed with the small ball for for that possession, and then you've kind of got some players that are maybe out of position and, and not used to running the routes that you normally would in that execution. Um, and I, I guess in this circumstance, I'm looking at Ian Clark. Um, you know, I was playing the four man in that in that. Uh, in that set and looking a little bit lost and, and, and not uh, finding himself free. But yeah, I thought, you know, people are going to look at Dally um, on that one and, and question the pass. Oh, I thought there has to be some responsibility put on Shaili in that circumstance as well. Um, he sets a screen for Chris. They, uh, Sean McDonald does a great job of getting over the screen. Milton Doyle is defending the inbounds, helps out on Chris, takes that away. Now, Shaili had a pretty easy opportunity just to put a little bit of weight on Jordan Crawford, mm. and then just put a target hand up and then just receive the ball and get fouled. Yeah. 
he didn't put that weight on him and he let Crawford go and deny that spot that spot that he was leading into. So I thought the execution there was a little bit poor and then it was a little bit of uh, hair on fire moment. Like, okay, well, what do we do now? Well, that's the initial pass and it's supposed to go to Chris if he's open, but if he's not open, then we're going to Illy. Neither of them open. And then there was no action after that and uh, it, it's easy to point the finger at Daly. Um, I, I think if you're going to throw the ball anywhere on the floor, he's probably chosen the, the best area in the sense that there's a crowd there, you could probably get battered out of bounds and you get yourself another five seconds. It was close to the sideline. You know, Chris looked like he tried to gather a call from or get a whistle, but mm. it's hard, hard, much harder to get a whistle in front of the opposition bench than in your own. Yes. Especially when the calls of hay are not there. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was an unfortunate situation that Melbourne United found themselves in, but, uh, all the credit to Tazzy. Um, they took away the uh, the action and a uh, remarkable play there by uh, Milton Doyle and, and then obviously Jack Bay. So <laughs> yeah. um, some of the most exciting basketball I've ever been privy to watching. Yeah. Cody mentioned a fascinating point that I hadn't thought of to me the other day. The pass reminded him of what we saw from Kyle Adnan being thrown in the deep end late in that game against Melbourne as well. I think it was, was it game one? Game one of that that series, I mean, remarkable how similar those those two sidebound plays ended up being. Yeah, no, the, the second one, obviously, yeah. the first one Kyle had was the deep one up in the backcourt, and the, and then the second one was, uh, yeah, yeah, the turnover on that. And, and look, that five second count goes a little quicker in your head when the uh, when the game's on the line, and and, and perhaps Daly had a few more moments to. You know, reconsider another option, but just watching the playback, there, there was no other option. Yeah. Um, it was really just uh, there was guys sort of scratching their head, going, "Well, do you go? Do I go? What do we do here?" So again, I go back to you know they had their small ball option out there, guys playing out of their usual position. The execution wasn't quite on point, um, and that's what you get left with. Yeah, yeah. I'll get your thoughts on that small ball later later on as well. Milton Doyle saving the ball, watching it live, I put my hands to my head, wondering, "What the hell are you doing?" It ended up working out great, but he spoke after the game and his explanation made a lot of sense and all of a sudden I understood exactly why he did it because he it didn't look like there was any chance that Sean McDonald had touched the ball, but he didn't want to leave that decision in the hands of the referees because he, I mean, you can understand this, he couldn't trust them to make the right decision, so he didn't want the game decided if they thought it was a Tasmania ball or not. So when he dived to save the ball, in hindsight he clearly did the right thing. Um, what did you think of the time when you when you saw that? <laughs> I hadn't heard that explanation, mm. and uh, that might be just a subtle jab. Um, he's a gentleman who obviously yes. had some power trouble during the course of the game, and uh, a few of those he may have thought were dubious or mm. a little bit uh, over-enthusiastic with maybe an unsportsmanlike. So maybe it's his very gentlemanly way of, because <laughs> yeah. like, he's a lovely gentleman, yep. a very gentlemanly way of having a jab. I don't think there was uh, there was any sort of dispute. And, and in the last, obviously, at the end of the game, they would go to a video of any contentious out-of-bounds play. Yeah. So I think it was just an instinct you play by him. Um, you know, he's a long rangey, high IQ player. Um, he had time, you know, time moves a little slower for a guy who's, who's that smart. And, and, you know, it was a little bit instinctive. But it was a huge play. And, and I actually like the play. Uh, I don't think you let the balls bail out of bounds in that situation because then you get Melbourne United setting up yes. um, defensively. But they caught Melbourne unawares um, in transition. And uh, whilst Melbourne put a lot of pressure and heat on that shot by Jack, I think over if you're doing percentages I think if they take the side ball out full court there they had no time out to advance the ball they're not going to get themselves a real great shot and they probably got the best shot they were going to get in that situation yeah I completely agree because if they stop the play I think while it might have helped them set up a play I think it helps Melbourne even more to be able to set up their, their defense so I yeah completely agree it turned out perfectly for them it also ended up in the perfect man's hands. I kind of feel like if if Jack McVeigh tried to drive to the basket or get inside the paint, he's going to end up less likely to make the shot than he was likely to make a half-court shot. I mean, he's he's the exact character of a person that is going to make a half-court shot to win a, a championship game, isn't he? I mean, he that's just it, it's just his makeup. He's got that mentality. Yeah. Um, he's a, a, a guy who visualizes a lot. He talks about that, talks about the way he prepares himself. And, you know, he's seen himself making just about every shot imaginable mm-hmm. for game winners yep. in his mind. And, uh, you know, though the guys who who make big shots generally are those guys that imagine those situations, you know, endlessly. And, uh, you know, he's a guy that uh, clearly 
wanted that moment and and, and uh, had envisioned itself, envisioned it for himself in the past. And uh, yeah, what an amazing shot! The greatest shot I've seen in, in NBL history. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And, um, and and you might be right. You can kind of time. Jack on with a sundial at times. Mm. He's not the most fleet of foot athlete <laughs> right. out there in the NBL. So whilst he's, he shot it with three seconds to go, I reckon he moved five seconds from half court to get <laughs> yes. to the rim. So yep. <laughs> he's, not, he's not the quickest of, uh, of athletes out there. So, yeah, that was a good look for him. He wanted it and he made it and he'll become a thing of legend in Tasmanian basketball. Yeah. One of my questions was going to be, where does it rate in shots in NBL history? And I, I mean, you've just answered that for me, but off the top of my head, the Kenny Ibekwe game winner to win a championship for New Zealand has to be right up there just because that actually clinched the championship. And I remember covering that game and I just sat there shaking my head. What I was seeing was an, that was an incredible turnaround jumper that he that he that he took. So that was a that was a huge shot. I mean, you've had some big ones in regular season games. I mean, you go back to last season, Tyler Harvey, very similar to to this shot from Jack against the New Zealand Breakers. But, you know, that's a regular season game and it was on a team that won, what, three games for the season. So it didn't mean a lot in the big scheme of things. You go back to Cedric Jackson's three-quarter shot for the Breakers against the Wildcats, which happened right in front of me. I was about two metres away from him as it happened. That was an incredible (laughs) shot. But, but, But again, that wasn't to win. It wasn't in a championship series. So, I mean, just because of the magnitude of the moment, and also the difficulty of the shot and and everything that went into it. Are you pretty comfortable to say it's the best shot we've seen in NBL history? Yeah, I think for for what it is, it is. It's the the most important great shot that I've ever seen. Mm. And, and you know, you think of great moments like you know the greatest block shot you ever you've ever seen. You mm-hmm. think of the Bam and the or or the LeBron James one off the window in the championship series. Like those are. Uh, captivate and become a legend. Now, oh, he, there's an 82 game regular season. Talk, talk, about block, team. talk about blocks. Sean Reddidge on CJ Bruden to send that series that season for the Wildcats and the Breakers to Game 3 was a, a pretty memorable moment too. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so there's, there's these moments that are captured all throughout regular seasons and pre-seasons and, and, and that are just as great, if not greater. Mm-hmm. But it's the moment and, and and getting it done in the moment and um, you know like I, I remember Nigel Purchase playing uh, full court John Elway deep ball um, against Brisbane up at Boondall one time mm-hmm. and, and and that was like yeah, yeah that's fluky you would think yeah. but I actually did a basketball clinic with Nigel the the the, the, the next week at Green Hills Primary School which was you know where where he grew up mm-hmm. actually and. Um, and all the kids, are, you know, they've been watching the game on Channel 7. They're telling, oh, can you do it again? Can you do it again? And he went back and did, replicated the shot and actually nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the only almost as great shot that I can think of off the top of my head. You know, the big way was a relatively regulation sort of mid-range jumper. Well, when I yeah. say regulation, he, he, he won a championship. Yes. It's uh, and that's where the greatness in that shot comes from. Uh, if that happens, you know, three minutes into a, into the first quarter yeah. of round three, bottom of the table clash. No one cares about no. it. Yeah, for sure. This is unbelievable. No matter what, in any circumstances, it's a great shot. But given the magnitude of the moment, it is one of the, if not the greatest moment in NBL history. Mm. Especially if they win a championship. I mean, that that is going to be replayed for the rest of our lives if they end up winning a championship because of, of that winner. You touched on this as well with, with Jack. I mean, I've, I've spoken to him a, a lot over the years and he's talked about how he talks to himself in the mirror about making big shots and wanting to be a big shot player. He's talked about how he, he writes down the shots he wants to make and that he, he makes the big shots and that's what he's made for. He he goes out and shoots and he, he talks to himself. He commentates himself about the moments that he's shooting in and he's, he's shooting to win a championship. And how much do you think it helps that he's got that mindset that he wants to be in that moment and he's put himself in that position, you know, in, in front of nobody, but he's put himself in that position to prepare himself for this moment. Do you think that helps when you actually do get in the moment for, for real? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's that want to be in that moment. Mm. Um, he's talked himself, he's talked that moment into existence um, and he's put himself in that position to be that man. And and without all that preparation, then he's he's not doing that. And obviously, he's, we've seen him hit big shots before. It's mm. not the first time. Um, uh, and, uh, it's his yeah, second game so, winner just at this season. Yeah, that's right. You know, he had one earlier in the, or might have been at the end of last year, I can't remember, but um, yeah, he had that big shot. No, it was earlier this season, for sure. 
Yeah, yeah. No, he had that one this year, and uh, you know, and he talked. He talked about it after that game as well. You know, he, he visualised mm. those moments and uh, he prepared for it. You know, you, you go through. You know, we could watch the tape back. Um, if you watch that tape back, there'll be moments where there's you know, other players. That you think, oh, maybe they had an opportunity there to, to make a big play, and they didn't take it. Yeah, Jack's not going to be the guy who shies away from that. Um, and, and neither is Milton Doyle, who obviously had the setup. Yep. Um, basket uh, a couple of possessions earlier. So and Daly in the isolation play against uh, Majuk Dank. Yes. Um, you know they're guys who are willing to take on the moment. Um, and we know Chris Golding's that player also. So yeah, that's what's made this a really special series is that we've got great players making great plays. That emotion straight after the game with Jack's interview with John Casey was incredible as well. I mean, you could you could tell he was caught up in the moment. <laughs> that was that was an incredible moment because he, he didn't know what to say and it, he, you but you could see the emotion and just how much it meant. Yeah, yeah. Look, I don't know Jack. Yeah, uh, I think I've met him once, and it was like he was with someone that he knew, and he, he sat away. And uh, yeah, he, he seems like a different character, though. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> he's, a, he's his own man. He's yeah. marching to the beat of his own drum, and, yeah. and that's a great. Thing. Um, you love it. You love to have those blokes, and um. Yeah, you know, they see the world and the game a little bit differently, and and they can lighten moments. But uh, yeah, he's 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 geeing himself up after the game. <laughs> yes. yeah. Come on, one more. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. I was sitting on the couch laughing, but I was <laughs> I was laughing and thinking it just how appreciative I was the moment that he was experiencing there, and he would have been going wild with his teammates afterwards. Yeah. Just yeah, you know, we got one more, and that's yeah. the focus of Teddy. You can see it's the focus. Scott Roth said something, we haven't done anything because mm-hmm. um, everyone's pumping up you know, their, their success in their yeah. career so far, um, in, in, their, in their history so far, and he's like, we haven't done anything. So they've got lofty standards, uh, lofty goals, and you can see it's permeating through the group, and, and, and you can see that in Jack in that post-game interview, and uh, you know, I think that's why I got the laughter going. I was just <laughs> like, yeah, these players are on. And, yeah. and that's one of the reasons why back into the championship. I, I yes. just feel like they're... Uh, a team that has tremendous self belief, and we've seen it all season. They haven't been great all year. Let, let's be honest. Oh, you know, oh. there was times where they, they really looked like they could miss the playoffs. Yeah. But their last few weeks, and and we know they're a team that don't defeat themselves. Oh. Um, they hang in games. You know, they've been down most of the series. They seem to find a way to get their noses in front in important moments. Uh, they have that self belief. And their body language is just amazing to me. Yep. They just, they will not defeat themselves. And um, they're certainly a product of their coach. I think Scott Ross is going to take a lot of the credit for the, the team he's uh, not just put together, but the way that they behave and the focus that they carry and the never say die attitude that they, uh, they always exhibit. Mm, no, absolutely. All right. So there's plenty more around that championship series for us to get through. We'll dissect the series a little bit more once we come back from this first break, and then I'll get your... Game four and potentially game five predictions to close the show. But before we take this first break, there's been a been a lot happening since we last spoke, Simon. So a few things I want to get your get your quick thoughts on. We haven't had a chance to talk about not only Brian Gorgian back at the Sydney Kings, but also the MVP and the championship winning captain Xavier Cooks now back at the Sydney Kings. What are your what are your thoughts? My thoughts, uh, Brian Gorgian's a pretty good coach and Xavier Cook's a pretty pretty good <laughs> basketball player. I, I think the Sydney Kings have uh, done done pretty well this off-season. That's one heck of a bounce back after this corny season. So you get the uh, the most successful NBL coach of all time and uh, and currently the best local player available for the NBL. Yeah, they're, 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 they're kicking goals. Chris Congress is, uh, as usual, having wonderful off-seasons and doing great things for Sydney basketball. Also big news at the South East Melbourne Phoenix, Simon. And Alan Williams, who you, you might remember going back to halfway through the season when we did our mid-season predictions and we were picking our MVP. And I, I had him as my MVP at that point because of how impactful he was. And Bryce hadn't quite strung together as long of being Bryce as he, as he had and, and would end up being. But what what's your reaction to, to Big Source no longer being at the Phoenix for next season? And following on from a discussion I had with Cody Cody last week, could you see him signing somewhere else in the, in the NBL? Um, well, absolutely. I, I hope we do see Alan Williams in the NBL. I think he's endeared himself, um, not just to his teammates and the, the people of the South East Melbourne, for, for, for the league in general, I think he's, uh, you know, his professionalism, uh, he's a fun person, he's got a wonderful personality, and I think that's shone through in his commentary and also mm. his appearances on TV. And uh, I think he's got himself a bit of a, uh, a backing uh, 
basketball public there. So for, from the standpoint of um, would I like to see him back in the league? Absolutely. Um, he's a wonderful chap. And uh, from a personal standpoint, I would definitely love to see him back in the NBL. Um, I think it's those sort of characters that make our league special. In regards to South East Melbourne and, and, and his departure, Look, I think this might be a situation. He's missed a lot of basketball, and as you said, you know he was an MVP caliber um, player at the beginning of the season. And um, but injuries have their toll. And South East have had, as we know, a lot of bad luck, particularly this year. It was just diabolical. And I'm going to guess that the the goal of uh, the off season, or the number one of the number one goals for South East, is putting a roster together that can stay on the floor now. I don't know the ins and outs of Alan's knee, and, but I dare say that there would have been uh, a little bit of uh, an assessment from the medical staff and the coaching staff and the, to weigh up any risks and whether or not South East Melbourne would be prepared to take those risks on of bringing Alan in back again next year. Now, um, again, not privy to those discussions, so I'm speculating. Yes. But I'm going to guess that South East need a, uh, they need a clean bill of health, and if there's any sort of leftover or doubt or risk or added risk to bringing Alan back, then they've probably said, no, we need to go in a different direction on those terms. Um, it's certainly not productivity, and he's a wonderful player. And, um, yeah, as I said, I, I do hope we get to see Alan back in the league because he's, uh, he, he's, he's not just a great player, but a, a, a great character. Yes, absolutely. One other player move we've seen already, even before free agency has started, was Sam Menenga leaving the Taipans to go home to the New Zealand Breakers. And um, I want to get your thoughts because it, it's an incredible show of faith from the Breakers in what they think of him because they – they paid out his second season of his contract at the Taipans and they have to pay him for this year. So that shows just how highly they, they think of him. As a as a player of being Sam, that must be a great feeling knowing that the club you're going to just thinks thinks that much of you. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's certainly, I'm not 100% across the terms of the, the release. Mm. Oh, I'd be very surprised if they're paying a full yes. year to Cairns for that. Oh, I think there might be a small a smaller um, yes. transfer fee. Yeah. But uh, New Zealand's done a very good job in the background over the years of, of bringing their New Zealand players home. Um, I know from South East Melbourne, you know, we lost mm. uh, Isaiah Liapo, who was contracted. You know, we took the chance on Yanni Wetzel. He wound up back in New Zealand. So, you know, th- these, these are also kids that have been in the college system for four years. Yeah. Like Sam Meninga, they come back, they play NBL, they get they're used to that being away from home, but all of a sudden being close to home, uh, maybe the urge um, is to, okay, well, yeah, I really would like to get home. But yeah, no, the Taipans have uh, taken full advantage of, uh, of that mm. and got themselves in a very, very good player in Sam Meninga with tremendous potential. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, he had a roller coaster season, but at, at best, what we saw from him is a. Uh, a really high quality player in that in that four spot. Before we take our first break, we've seen the WNBL Championship wrap up now a bit over a week ago as well, Simon. And th- this was a fascinating three game series as well. And I'm sure the Perth Lynx are kicking themselves for not closing it out at home. But gee, I mean, when you when you see what the Southside Flyers did in that game three back in Melbourne, and they were just they were too good. I mean. Lauren Jackson, Leilani Mitchell, Beck Cole, Mercedes Russell, who won the grand final M- MVP, Carly Ernst backing up those two bigs and comes out and hits three threes in about two minutes to blow the game wide open. What did you make of what we saw from the end of the WNBL NBL season? Yeah, it was a fairly dominant performance by Southside um, in game three in front of the home crowd. You know, the veteran players turned up. You know, Leilani Mitchell's performance I thought was outstanding. Yeah. Obviously Lauren Jackson's performance in the in, in the back end of the season has been pretty strong. Mercedes Russell was wonderful throughout mm. the, the season and uh, certainly the back end of the season especially. I thought she was pretty unlucky to not get a, a, a nod into the uh, MVP consideration. Uh, I think they take their votes after, you know, with about three weeks to go on the season. So mm. <laughs> I think she had a few BOGs uh, at the back end there that might have helped put her in the, in the running. But yeah, look, I, it, it was, uh, well, it was a bit of a Bradbury effort too, to be honest. <laughs> yes. uh, Perth lost back to the last minute mm. um, of play was, Quite, I don't know. There, was, there should have been some Benny Hill music in the background. I think. And yes. Yeah, yeah, Lawrence Jackson's car uh, in sending Bailey, you know, ninety feet to go shoot free throws to put them up, mm. um, which was diabolical play. 
but then mainly with diabolical from the line. Yes. And then Southside get the ball back and Mercedes Russell pumps it out of bounds. And then Mayley has another yeah, well, and, then we get, and then we get the Mailey missed layup. Um and then the offensive rebound. Like it was it was a rough finish. Mm. But people seem to like close finishes regardless <laughs> yes. of the standard of play sometimes. Yeah. So it certainly was exciting. But I thought that must have been extraordinarily damaging for the, the Perth Lynx players to be so close yeah. on the home court. Um, they've had to do some travel during the playoffs, obviously playing Townsville in round one. So that travel to Townsville, back to Perth, over to Melbourne, back to Perth, and then to come back to Melbourne again. And, and with the scars of game two, it was always going to be difficult. But you've got to tip your hat to the performance of Southside. No uh, veteran players made veteran plays, and mm. and everybody came to the party. And uh, and uh, yeah, Point was mainly put in another soccer. And yeah, they they look damaged um, from game two, Perth to me. But all the all the credit needs to go to Southside. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, just touching on that from a Lynx perspective, how do you try to now deal with that over over the off season and come back next season? Because it's it's remarkable how similar it was to what happened to them two years ago in the grand final series as well. I know a lot of the players aren't the same, but to get so close to winning a championship in two out of the last three years from winning that game two on your home floor. How do you put that behind you now and try to bounce back next year? Look, it can be difficult. You know, from a mental standpoint, there's going to be some scarring there for the players and they need to overcome that. But they keep pretty heavy schedules in the last season with their NBL ones and their three on threes and their, you know, Opals games. So there's going to be plenty of, uh, of I guess, distractions that they'll need their attention. <laughs> and, and so hopefully that helps put the, the game or the series behind them. But at the same time, I think, uh, you know, the coaching staff will need to look at the way they go about things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is a team that can go out and score heavy and they shoot the ball a lot and they shoot the ball early. And if that shot's not going down, they're quite a vulnerable basketball team. Yep. So maybe they need to add a few more elements to their game as well to be uh, to be a championship uh, team. You know, when, when the ball's dropping, they're a very, very good basketball team. Um, and but as we saw in game three, if, uh, if those shots aren't dropping, then they can be very ordinary as well. Yes, yep, absolutely. All right, plenty of time to wait to see how that unfolds. But more immediately, Simon, we need to break down this championship series in the NBL a bit more. So let's take a quick break. And then we, when we come back, we'll, we'll dissect what we've been seeing. Can you picture the first goal before the ball has even bounced? Can you read the footy future in the mullet of a full forward? You've got the touch. Got the touch? Download the Tab Touch app today. You win some, you lose more. All right, Simon, I'm fascinated to let you put your analysing cap on and your coaching hat on to look through what we've seen so far in this championship series. Let's start with how you were feeling after game one because that was a dominant performance from, from Melbourne United. It's the first time we've seen the Jack Jumpers blown out this whole season and it's their biggest loss of the season. After game one, did you think it was Melbourne that was too good in this series or did you still have some hope that the Jack Jumpers could find a way back into it? No, I think just historically, if you go through... Um, Mm, you know, five game series, seven game series, uh, even a three game series. Um, through NBA or NBL history, you'll see lots of blowouts and then a quick turnaround and and a, and a, the opposite result yeah. um, happen. So I think the Jack Jumpers, while not being the greatest team all season long, have certainly earned the right and earned our and should have earned our respect mm-hmm. um, as a basketball in public for us to think this was an anomaly. You know, they don't get beat by large margins virtually ever. So the fact that it happened, and in a, in a big game, and you don't sort of gloss over it, but you also say, well, no, hang on, history's going to tell us that, you know, they're, they're made of some pretty good stuff, the, the, the Jack Jumpers. Um, they're very well led, and um, I wouldn't be just packing it up just yet if I'm them. Um, and I have tipped the Tassie Jack Jumpers for the series. So maybe I was just holding on to my, uh, my, my, my own tips on that one. But I, I wasn't too worried, but I was certainly extremely impressed by Melbourne United in that game. Their shooting performance yeah. was excellent. Um, led obviously by Chris Golding and JLA was dominating in the in, inside. Uh, yeah. And they had performances across the board in that game. So yeah, there, there was a little bit to, to, to be concerned about, but um, at the same time, I think the Jack Jumpers have, 
should have earned our respect by now in the sense that we, we, we should expect them to come back strong. No, absolutely. What about by the, I think it was three minutes into the second half of game two down in Hobart and Melbourne had just come out and hit the first 11 points of, of the third quarter. They were leading 55 to 40. What was going through your mind by that stage? So maybe my concerns were starting to uh, <laughs> were starting to build just at this point, and um, Melbourne were looking really strong. But uh, but then you know I think it was the third quarter, wasn't it, when, when McVay stood up and, and just put a, a little bit of a mini run together himself, and uh, Sean McDonald was playing really well as well, um, and, and they made that comeback halfway through the third quarter pretty quick. But it was on the back of McVay. I know he had, he had a pretty deep three, and then he backed Ali down in the post and found Marcus Lee for, for, for a bucket and, and one. And then McVay was fouled off the ball and got to the free throw line. So it was McVay that got, that, that yeah. got you know, that cut loose a little bit. And, you know, Melbourne were doubling him early in the post, which, which I thought, I would have thought that you'd give Travers a chance um, to, to, to guard him one out. But straight off the bat, Melbourne were, were, were doubling him on as soon as the ball hit the floor and even in the wide post. As soon as he start backing down, they they send the double. Um, they got themselves in a little bit of a little bit of mischief there too, Melbourne, with that. And that's how um, Jordan Crawford got going early with some wide open looks in the first quarter of that game. But but yeah, then there was single coverage uh, in that third quarter, and McVay took advantage of it. And yeah, he's been special. Yes, yes. The last seventeen minutes of that game were incredible. So after Melbourne was leading by fifteen points and. They well and truly looked on track to be taking a 2 0 lead in this series. From that moment, the last 17 minutes, the Jack Jumpers outscored them 42 to 22. So Melbourne scored 22 points in that last 17 minutes of the of, of the game. They shot 7 of 28 over that period. They had five turnovers as well. Um, what did you see that changed? How did Tasmania completely take Melbourne out of out of their offensive groove? Yeah, well, I think we saw a little bit less of JLA as being a focal point, yep. obviously. And, um, yeah, I think Melbourne made some poor decisions. Um, I think there was a... Daly had a reverse layout there at one stage. It maybe should have been a kick out for a catch and shoot three. Mm. Uh, Ely may have forced the, the couple of uh, baskets in transition. Now, he made a couple as well. Yep. So I thought he forced the pace a little bit where maybe Melbourne could have uh, maybe looked to get the ball in Chris's hands at some stage. And they found a little bit of a, a, an action that was working for them, Tazzy. The, the McVay um, and Magne 4-5 pick and roll. They got a couple of uh, back-to-back baskets out of that. Um, so, yeah, no, the Jackies just found some things that were winning and, and, and just kept uh, pressing and, and I just thought the coaching job by Scott Roth um, was just phenomenal. Um, you know, Jordan Crawford started the game white hot and then virtually set out the second half yeah. <laughs> with, uh, with the preference going to Sean McDonald who, who got himself hot and was making plays and um, and so just that trust and, and what I love and I kind of touched upon it earlier just the the body language and the one mindedness of the Tassie Jack Jumpers is you don't see frustration. Mm. Jordan Crawford playing, you know, the house down, he's and he struggled in, in game one, comes out red hot, goes to the bench, does barely comes back in, but no body language issues. Right. Whereas you can start to see a little bit of frustration. You know, Melbourne United get yeah, being very, very aggressive with the referees. Daly wants a review on just about every call. JLA is looking frustrated at times. He's going to the bench and watch. You know, there seems to be a bit of disconnect right now at this moment with JLA. And yeah, like the differences in the, the way that uh, the two teams are carrying themselves. I just think it favours Tazzy a little bit right now. Melbourne need to get themselves back in a groove not worry about referees. I know they're having success with the complaining. It seems to be that they, whenever they do complain, that, that there's a call getting made up for them. Mm. But I think they just need to focus on what they need to focus on, and, and that's their uh, their execution. And making sure that the ball is getting in Chris's hands just a little bit more. Um, and I remember early in the season thinking that Melbourne was a little bit heavy on the early offense. Um, you know, the ball... Seem to be stuck with Illy, seem to be stuck with Dally, um, and that you know the guys who maybe need touches aren't getting the touches. And you know if we go long periods and that's happening, then it's hard for some guy to get back in that groove. So yeah, I just feel like that ball's got to pop a little bit more for Melbourne United. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Okay, so game three. Um, I mean, we we talked about the last minute, but it was an incredible game the entire night. But I think the entire game changed once once Scott Roth decided to go to the small ball lineup. So he had Majuk Deng in that five spot for the entire 
last quarter after Marcus Lee hurt his knee and, and he didn't didn't go back to, to Will Magne and it proved an absolute masterstroke on two ends because Majuk Deng came up huge and he had 15 points in the fourth quarter alone. But then, to me, the game turned to Tasmania's favour once Dean Vickerman decided to follow suit and went small ball as well. And they looked a completely unsettled team in a lot of ways without either Joe Luwalo, Chul or Ariel Hutporty out on the out on the court when they've they've built so much of their team around those guys. What did you make of Scott Ross' decision to go small ball and Dean Vickerman then following suit? Yeah, at the time I wasn't sure uh, Magne was was injured because mm. <laughs> um, I thought you know that that, that definitely would be you know, uh, he starting. Majuk started the, the the fourth quarter at the four spot and uh, they went with Chris Lewis. Um, and they run that pin down for, uh, or the turnout action there for Majuk Deng to start the quarter. He drains a three, then they switch the rolls and they run one for Fabian uh, Chris Lewis and he, he missed the three. And yes. then they went to Majuk Deng at the five from then on. Oh, I think the um, the the win certainly went to Scott Roth mm-hmm. um, with a small ball. And for a number of reasons. Firstly, obviously, the performance of Majuk Deng and... Um, him putting the ball in the hole now, Majuk. Uh, and I think I'd be kind in saying this might be challenged mm-hmm. a little bit at the defensive end. <laughs> yes. And um, and Melbourne took him on a few times and, and missed. Mm. It easily could have been okay if they make buckets there. This is going to really cost Tazzy. But um, and, and even Daly, you know, scored a couple of times against him in those in those switches and mismatches down the stretch. But. Um, you know, if, if Melbourne get over the line, then maybe we say they draw even in that small ball matchup. But, you know, we can only judge it on the end result. But then, um, you know, besides making those shots, they created an element of confusion mm-hmm. when uh, Travers was at the five defending. They weren't sure if they were switching or showing on the on balls. Left the Duke Deng open on one, left Crawford to drive the lane and get himself a couple of layups. Uh, one pull up jumper for Crawford. There was just. There was clearly with that small ball lineup, Melbourne weren't comfortable, and you know even to the point where you know there was a bit of isolation. JLA, I think, was uh, at one stage guarding um, Milton Doyle um, on a switch. Um, obviously, this wasn't the pure small ball um, one, but Milton got a contested mid range jump, and I think it was tipped in. I might be getting this wrong, but uh, it was tipped in by uh, Majuk Deng no, um, right. because of the switch. So, yeah. Yeah, there was plays there. There was another one also where there was a switch at the other end. Now, this one, I'm, I'm pretty certain I'm going to get this one right, where Majuk Dean ends up on Ian Clark in an isolation. And um, and uh, Ian doesn't score. They run the other way, and Ian's matched up against Majuk Dean. Mm. He ends up getting an, an offensive rebound tip in, and, you know, it's just clearly giving up way too much height. So those mismatches, the switches... Um, there was a lot going on for both teams. Um, I think at times Melbourne looked like, okay, they, they've won in those switches as well, but then there was times where their pick-and-roll defense was completely at sea um, because of their, the lack of role clarification or exactly what those players were trying to achieve, um, which which Tassie thrived upon. So, yeah, at the end, um, I, the, the credit goes to Scott Roth. His team won. They won on the back of it. Um, Matruk Deng, um, whilst, yes, he can be challenged defensively, he wasn't exposed no, too much, no. um, and certainly the credits were in his favour from an offensive standpoint. And um, yeah, and, and look, there's another one I want to bring up as well, yeah. and, it, and it's not really conducive to this down the stretch game. But Melbourne have been really aggressive in trying to get isolations against Jack McRae. Again, another bloke who's challenged at that end at times. But I think he's held up tremendously, and there were some plays in this game where he was isolated. Uh, once against Ian Clark, where he was able to move his feet and cut him off. Um, and there's been some others where he's just been able to compete. And this happened in game two. They were really aggressive against him. Uh, I can't remember what, what Luke Travis shot from the floor, but I know he was trying to take him off the dribble at times and uh, and, and was inefficient. Chris tried to take him off the dribble at times. Daly was trying to take him. Play. He's had everyone going at him, but he's mm. been able to hold up enough, just enough to give uh, Tassie the advantage so far. You make a good point. In that game too, Travis went one of seven. Yeah, yeah. So, and the one that he got, and, and again, I'm trying to go back to him. It, it was similar to uh, a basket he had in in um, most recent game, where there's a drag screen, and and, and when um, when McVeigh's stuck in the nail, helping on, on, on off the ball, and there's a quick ball reversal. Travis is just too quick. Mm. He's just too quick off the ball. 
for McVay to recover. And when they can get their spacing right, Melbourne, and they make that quick ball reversal, Travers has shown to be just a little bit too athletic. But they haven't been able to take advantage of it often enough um, for it to damage uh, McVay. So, yeah, hats off to McVay and the, the efforts he's putting in at that end. Again, he's not very blessed um, <laughs> with, with quickness and lateral speed, but he's putting in everything he can into it and uh, it hasn't been a problem per se for the Jackies no. to this point. No. Last thing about the small ball. In hindsight, will Dean Vickerman feel like he did the right thing by matching the small ball or... Would it be preferred to find a way to keep either JLA or Huck Porty out there to try to expose Tasmania up the other end? Yeah, it was an interesting one. He was very quick to hook JLA yeah. Yeah. when he had that one closeout on um, on Majuk Deng in that corner. He drove, got a bump, um, a little bit of a mid-range fadeaway and one, um, and that was it. Yeah. Uh, I thought just prior to that, JLA had some good post-ups. They were sending the double. He found Delhi on a roll to the basket. Delhi threw it away. Um, I'll have one where JLA had a deep post against Majuk Deng and just put him in the basket. I thought they had an advantage at that end. And I don't think JLA is going to give up too much of a disadvantage if he's really locked in uh, controlling Matuk Deng the, uh, at the other end. And it ended up being, you know, the other guys had troubles with him as well. So I think Dean will reassess that one. Um, and even the frustration with JLA of coming in and out, in and out, in and out in that last quarter, mm. um, I think they've got to get his head right because his body language to me doesn't look great. You know, he's not marching past the coach, giving him a five, talking to his teammates. He's marching straight to the end of the bench mm. and his head's down and he looks frustrated to me. So they need JLA firing if they want to take full advantage of their roster. Um, and so, yeah, I think Dean would have that moment back. I think he would have maybe per- um, persevered with JLA um, at the five spot. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I think you would agree that Jack McVeigh would be probably leading MVP voting for this series right now, but Shaley wouldn't be far behind either. His, his numbers are, are good, but it's not about numbers w- with Shea for the influence that he, he has on games. Look at the fact that across three games, Melbourne, they've only won one of these three games, but they're plus 37 with Shea out on the court. He's made big offensive plays. He's been aggressive offensively, but you know his defense that he's played on, pretty much switching between Milton Doyle and Jordan Crawford at times has been outstanding. What have you made of Shaley's three games so far? Well, we now how much better a team Melbourne are with him on the floor. You know, he's he's had uh, some good scoring games as well. I would like to see perhaps the ball get out of his hand. Oh, I'd like to see him creating for others a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not his point. Like, he's not a natural point guard. Like he throws a good lob pass and pick and rolls. Mm. Um, but like, he's not. Yeah, he doesn't have the dexterity of the great point guards. Um, But defensively, he's a a lead as they come. And, you know, he takes whoever he's playing on out of the game. And uh, and obviously, he's got all those other intangibles at the defensive end as well. You know, he makes those plays like the steal on um, on Marcus Lee early in the game. You know, it's just a, there's only one other bloke that I know of who used to do that consistently. And, and uh, yeah, he, he votes for the defensive player of the year on our program. So he's not quite at that realm, but geez, he's not far off. You know, he's only got the one defensive player of the year. He really is in that mould. Um, he does control the game from the defensive end. I think I've mentioned this before. He reminds me of Deion Sanders mm-hmm. in the NFL. Mm-hmm. You know, when he's out in the field, you basically just shut down half the side of the field. Mm-hmm. You don't want to put the ball anywhere near him. And Shay's similar in the sense that he can really blow up every DHO, um, top lock guys out of the game. Like, he's just such an effective weapon. And uh, you know, even the foul he drew on Crawford, which I thought was a bad call, I thought it was extremely soft, but not, not coincidentally right from the Melbourne bench, where he's just, you know, Jordan put two hands in his chest, a little nudge, but we see it you know, a thousand times a game. But he was able to extract the whistle on his movement on that one. He just makes plays constantly, and he's been exceptional in this series, and, and they miss him when he's not out there. Yes, yeah, and I thought that was a difference in game two. He was the only one keeping them in with a chance late in that game, but once he fell out, I felt like Melbourne's chances went, went with him too. Yeah, he was. He was really aggressive down the stretch. You know, I thought there was a couple of... I know he shot the ball pretty well to the field, but I thought there was a possession or two where uh, maybe that should have... That was a little bit rushed. Uh, but then, obviously, when I was struggling to score, he did score in transition. So it's, um, it, it's, it's a balancing act. But Melbourne need to get the ball in the hands of JLA. They need Chris with more touches. Um, and I think 
that's when they're at their best. And right now, the ball's in Shea and, and Delhi's hands a lot. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But uh, he's been excellent in this series. That gets on to my next point. I want to get your thoughts on on Matthew Delavadova because is he? I mean, you can't fault his effort. I mean, clearly this means a lot to him, and he's giving his all. But is he trying to do too much? Is he trying to take too much on and not getting, like you said, his teammates as involved as well as as he perhaps could be? Well, I, I think he's probably the difference. Uh, I think there, there seems to be, and, and just listening to Shay in the interview during the game, he, he was being, you know, Dean had been encouraging to be aggressive. Mm. I think when there's switches that they're, they're letting the point guards or the guards or any mismatch sort of really cut off the offense and go at the mismatches. Uh, so maybe it's not so much uh, the players, maybe the team just needs to reevaluate, okay, what is it that we want to get out of our half court sets? Who do we want touching it? How do we want to present ourselves at that end, and what's the balance that we're happy to strike? Again, you know, Melbourne were a possession away from the wing down through, um, and being in a position to close us out themselves. So we're really sort of uh, picking pretty heavily yeah. here <laughs> yes. to, to find fault in, 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 in these players. But at the same time, you want to be at your absolute peak performance in this one, and I think that ball popping a little bit more, um, and Chris finding a few more shots. Uh, and, and let Delhi and and uh, and Shay, you know, let them go in the uh, in the in the half court, or sorry, in the in the early transition. But maybe in the half court, we look to move that ball a little bit more and, and to try and find some other targets as well. Even Ian Clark as well. I feel like he's been a little bit underutilized so far, especially just not getting as many looks as perhaps he could as well. So maybe he he and Chris both they can find ways of getting them some some more more shots. Well, it's a quandary, isn't it? I thought Ian had some some good looks in the in game three yep. early. You know, he was three of eleven from the field. He missed a couple of ones that you consider dollies. There was two back to back threes. Mm. One was on a, and this is where the Jack McVay thing comes in. Chris had isolation yeah. versus Jack McVay. Yep. Blows by him like he's a uh, traffic cone, um, and then the help defense comes in. He mm. kicks out to to Ian Clark, and he misses a three. Yep. I think the possession before that, he may have missed a wide open three as well, and that, that might be on a steal on the inbounds. I yeah. can't remember, mm. but uh, I know that he missed back to back threes. And you're looking at Ian Clark and saying, "Oh, geez, Tazzy have dodged bullets," um, and and they did dodge a few. And, and Melbourne have just got to put the lid on those ones, and and then they wouldn't find themselves in the position they did find themselves in down the stretch there. Jordan Crawford's a fascinating one as well. I mean, he had a really, really strong um, regular season. He deserved to be in consideration for one of the all NBL teams. He was a great scorer, but he then hit a hit a brick wall in the last two games against the Wildcats, and then in in game one of this series, he only had seven points, went three of thirteen. But then he came out. He had thirteen points six minutes into game two, and then, like you touched on earlier, virtually didn't play again for the rest of the of of the night. He only took two more shots for the entire rest of the. The game, so the last 34 minutes, and we virtually didn't see him in the second half. He then comes out 14 points in game three, and he had his moments as well. <laughs> it's been a hell of a roller coaster ride over the last five games for him. What do you what do you make of it? Yeah, look, it has. I've got nothing but admiration for the way he's gone about it. To be honest, yeah, I thought he was on the back end of some horrific calls by the referees in game three. Mm. The, the the foul off the ball um, on Delhi. Um, where Daly threw himself back, just a horrible whistle. Um, it, there was a succession of horrible whistles, I thought, in the first quarter, and he was the recipient of two of them. Yeah. That was a bad whistle, referees blowing toward a reaction rather than what they see, which is uh, crime punishable by being dropped, in my opinion, but it's not going to happen. And then we saw an incredibly soft call in the post, the next possession down. And so he's got two fouls in the first quarter and, and now, you know, Coach Roth has got a, a juggling act to, 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 to go around. Then we saw that soft push off um, again. Yeah, it was there, um, but you, you better be consistent with that call and not just call it when Dean's yelling in your ear for it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, look, I thought he was on the back end of some, some tough decisions there, but during that fourth quarter when Melbourne were um, throwing some different lineups out of there, and he's running you know, because some double drags going for him. A little bit of confusion from Melbourne United as, as to how they wanted to cover that, whether they were switching or showing, or he, he took full advantage of it and 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 created some great plays for them. I thought the mental toughness on show from him was excellent. In game two, the mental toughness for him to come out and yeah. they were doubling off him onto Jack McVeigh and letting him open on in, in those perimeter shots. Mm-hmm. 
and you know, the fortitude for him to step up to the plate in a big game, knock them down, get Tassie on the right pathway. Huge. So he's played his role. Uh, a little bit of luck goes his way um, in regards to the whistle, and maybe we see even a better performance. Speaking of the whistle, I mean, we've seen a lot of a lot of flopping in this series, a lot of feigning for calls, a lot of playing for, for calls, and a lot of strange whistles. But those those two calls for flopping on Will Magne or, or a warning and then the, the flopping call on Will Magne, I mean, they didn't look like flops to me. I mean, he got a lot of contact on, on both those players. They were two strange whistles as well. And, I mean, we haven't seen the best of Will Magne as a result of the whistle this whole series. Okay, I need to find a nice way to say this. <laughs> I have no sympathy for Will Magne right now. Mm-hmm. Now, he's my pre-series pick for MVP. So I think that says a lot about the respect I have for Will Magne. Um, but his flopping and flailing has been exposed. Yep. And uh, now he's not getting the benefit of the doubt. Now, I think some might say that Chris was pushed out of bounds on that last play, not giving him the whistle. Yep. I have no sympathy for these people who are playing for the whistle right now, and we're seeing it. Um, you know, Dally's wanting a review on everything. Dally, I've got no sympathy for you. I've got none, none for you. You're flopping, you're flailing, you're trying to get the whistle. Uh, Drimmick does the same, has done for most of his career. Uh, look, there's guys who are trying to play for whistles. And when you don't get them, I, I've got nothing but, you know, bad luck, mate. Mm-hmm. Play harder. Those ones that involved Magne, I thought he overplayed the one in the chest that Delhi had, the shoulder through yeah. the chest. Yes, there was contact. Is that sending a 6'10", 235-pound bloke to the floor like it did? Delhi's pretty strong, but no, mm-hmm. it shouldn't have had that result. I'm okay with that. That was, I think, the tech foul. Yep. The first one, JLA putting a shoulder on him um, through the chest plate. Again, he fell. He, he folded over. I've got no problem with it. Yeah, I'm okay. You, you caught one in the chest. You don't fold forward. You go backwards. Yeah, I've, I've got no problems with those calls, but that's mainly because I feel like Will's been trying to extract calls. When we talk about Will's performance so far in this series, I actually rate it a lot higher than other people might. Yep. I, uh, I, I thought that he's played some really pivotal moments and possessions um, with his rim protection. And sometimes it's just a straight-up intimidation that he brings around the rim. Now, both teams in the pick and roll have clearly said that we are going to give up floaters. We're going to guard the roller first. Um, And so they're taking away a lot of action for the bigs on the pick and rolls. So he's been um, strangled a little bit in those plays, which he's very, very good at. Mm. So, yes, he's been taking a little bit out of there. So, so the opportunity to score hasn't been there quite as much. And you're seeing Sean McDonald getting a whole bunch of runners. You're seeing Crawford get a whole bunch of runners. Yep. Um, as on the opposite end, you're also seeing Dally and uh, Shaili and Clark getting a lot of runners. So the, 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 the both teams have said, we're taking away the roller and we're going to live with the runners and the shots at the rim by the guards and hopefully we can get some extra help there. So I think from that standpoint, we're seeing a bit of a drop in production. But I thought he's played really well at times with regards to that rim protection. I love to see that from him. Uh, he's incredibly brave for the way he chases down the ball at times. And for a guy who's had a uh, history of injuries, he, he certainly goes after it. I just hope that he starts to hold his ground a little bit more and and, and, uh, and doesn't feel the need to sort of try and accentuate contact. No. So, yep. again, there was a bit of a contact on both those plays. But I'm okay with those flop calls because I feel like there's uh, uh, there's maybe a couple that they've missed. Yep, I, th- I think you summed it up well. Nothing more I can add. So that's, <laughs> I think we've got we've done a great job dissecting all of that as well, Simon. So thanks for putting your thinking cap on for all of that. Let's take our last break, and then when we come back, we'll wrap things up. Can you picture the first goal before the ball has even bounced? Can you read the footy future in the mullet of a full forward? You've got the touch. Got the touch? Download the Tab Touch app today. You win some, you lose more. Okay, back on Hoop Seven's basketball hustle. I'm here with Simon Mitchell once again this week, and and Simon, our voting is in on your Galen Award. So each week during the NBL season, you picked out who you thought was the best team man from each NBL round, and we ended up narrowing it down at the end of the season to your three nominees. So. For anyone that's trying to catch up, I named this award in honour of Galen Young, who is no longer with us, but I just felt he was that ultimate team man as the Wildcats finally broke through for a 2010 championship. And 
that's what this award is is in honour of. So you ended up narrowing it down to Will Magne of the Jack Jumpers, Hiram Harris of the Wildcats, Sam McDaniel of the Brisbane Bullets. We put it to our to our listeners to cast a vote, and you probably won't be too surprised, Simon, to learn that from those votes that we had cast, Hiram Harris ended up getting 51% of the vote. Will Magne came in second with 27%, Sam McDaniel 22%. Did our listeners get it right in your mind? Uh, I reckon we could have had just about anyone from the Perth Wildcats <laughs> roster nominated and just might have been the same result. But um, look, I don't think you could get one wrong out of those three. I mm-hmm. think they all play pivotal roles on their team. Um, and I think they uh, are all unsung heroes. Now, Hiram Harris, with his injection into the starting five and uh, and being used a little bit more, I thought turned the Wildcats season around. But one of those blokes is still playing, so I probably would have favoured him just a fraction. But I don't think you can get it wrong. I think uh, Hiram's story is a wonderful story of of commitment to the game, commitment to getting better, and not taking no as an answer. Uh, too too slow, too small, doesn't shoot the ball well enough. Name name the thing. You can find a thousand reasons for him not to be in our league. Mm-hmm. Well, he just won't take any of those for to heart. He's like, no, nah, I'll outwork you, I'll outplay you, and I'll find a way to beat you. And he consistently does it, and that's why I love him. Yep, absolutely. So... Our friends at Sports Card World as well, Simon, which is a, a card shop in Adelaide, which Scotty, Scotty Ninnis has had a lot to do with over the, over the years. And going back 30 years, he even opened up his own, his own shop in Melbourne when he was playing at the South East Melbourne Magic. So thanks to Scott Ninnis for this connection. But our friends at Sports Card World are giving away to the people that did vote on this award a, a full box of the NBL Tops trading cards. So what I've done, Simon, is I've put all of our names into a bit of a bit of a, a draw here, so I've got a list of them. Let me give a drum roll, and we'll pick out a winner. Thanks to Sports Card World. There you go. You you might recognise this this name as well, Simon Jordan McCullum. You can see his analysis on the NBL pop up, and this wasn't wasn't a concocted result. This was a genuine draw. I put all the names on the list. I hit pick a random name and Jordan McCollum is the name that that came out so he'll enjoy opening those packs of cards it would have been a very analytical vote <laughs> yes it would have I, I'm sure he did his study and put the numbers to it before he, he cast his vote <laughs> so well done to Jordan we'll get we'll get that prize to you thanks to sports card world were you much of a trading card person Simon I uh no I uh I I, I had the footy cards as a kid yep I had my KISS trading cards when they were killing it back in the uh, 70s and early 80s. Yep. And then uh, probably probably put the card game away after that. So <laughs> not, not my thing. I'm, I'm not a big knick-knack kind of guy. I, uh, I, I don't spend my money on those sorts of things. Yep, no, probably, probably a good idea. But if anyone else wants to get onto your cards, head to Sports Card World in Adelaide or head to their website and they'll, they'll look after you. Let's get to a... Preview of the rest of this championship series thanks to TabTouch, Simon. So check out the odds at tabtouch.com.au or download the TabTouch app. And Cody's come up with an exclusive. So go to the exclusive section and you'll you'll come up with something for game four that you can, can put your money on as well. Well, let's get down to business, Simon. Does Tasmania wrap it up on Thursday night in Hobart in game four or are we going back to a game five in Melbourne? Uh, this is such a flip of the coin prediction. Because I could see Melbourne's bet really stepping up and playing big. And Chris Golding's a big, big game player. Daly, obviously, with his experiences. I think Jowley's primed for a comeback game. I think Dean's going to throw him a little bit more consistency in his minutes and, and let him play longer stretches. Um, so I could see a Melbourne comeback. But I think the passion of the people of Tasmania... The players have just been so solid and Scott Ross coaching brilliance. I'm just leaning towards the Jack Jumpers in another nail biter. Can you think of a more amazing story if they're able to do it? I mean you you went so close to doing it as a new club with the South East Melbourne Phoenix. I mean you were you were within touching distance as well. I don't don't need to go back through that with you and bring up old wounds, but you, you, you almost did what they they're doing, but this story of the Jack Jumpers and the way they've captured the imagination of the whole state, how amazing would it be if they can complete the job, especially on their, their home floor? It will be phenomenal. And, I mean, it's absolutely the blueprint for 
uh, expansion teams. Um, I think the way they've captured the hearts of the people of Tasmania, uh, I think the way they go about their business, I think the Scott Roth is a spokesman for the league. Mm. The emotional attachment that he clearly has for Tasmania and its people, I think it's just a uh, it's a Cinderella story that uh, you know hopefully has a happy ending for them. Yeah, look, uh, uh, it's a Disney movie waiting to happen, really, isn't it? <laughs> it is absolutely is. If by chance you're wrong and it goes to a game five, do you give the do you give Tasmania a chance to win again in Melbourne, or would the pendulum swing back towards Melbourne if it does end up going to a game five? Or I mean, is it too hard to tell before we actually see game four? Yeah, well, I don't. I don't think uh, I'm not giving Melbourne much chance if they can't win this one. So, <laughs> yes. out of, out of the park. so, so we, we do need to see this game. Yeah. Um, but I don't think. Yeah, I think these two teams are so evenly matched that it's very, very difficult to predict a winner. Uh, I think we've seen Melbourne being dominant throughout the courses of games, and and Tassie come back and win. Um, and, it, and it's because of match ups. So I think it's the changes the coaches are making. And mistakes that players are making as well with their communication, especially pick and roll defense. Um, so it's really difficult because I don't see there's an outstanding or a, a dominant team in this just at this point. I, I'm leaning towards Tassie. If it goes to game five, the home teams definitely have an advantage. Mm. I think throughout history, we've seen home teams clinch, you know, that you get the crowd, yeah. everybody's battle weary, and you're looking for that extra thing to pull you over the line. Now, belief in your team and your teammates and, and your systems and all that, yep, that might still be there, but that gets chipped away at over five games. And, you know, everybody's looking for something extra to help them over the line. We saw it in the WNBL um, with a dominant game three by Southside. We've seen it historically um, with the home team clinching on their, in the decider. Um, I go back to my time at Melbourne United and having Adelaide in game five. And, yeah. And whilst it was a close game at times, it felt like, you know, we led from go to low and it felt like we controlled the game in, in that circumstance. And I could certainly see Melbourne United doing that again, especially with, you know, the leaders like Chris Golding. But there's something about this Tassie team and a team of destiny that I'm, maybe I'm just hoping for it, <laughs> um, but I can feel it with this group. Yeah. All right. Let's let Thursday night in Hobart play out. So that'll be game four of this championship series. So we'll wait and see what happens there. Um, apart from a Melbourne United supporter, I don't think anyone in the country would be too upset to to watch the Jack Jumpers clinch it. So we'll see how it plays out. But it's been a lot for us to dissect, Simon. It's been fascinating to pick your brain and get your thoughts. Hopefully everybody enjoyed listening. Thank you to Hoop7 and Tab Touch for making it possible once more. I'm Chris Pike and I'll sign off there and let you finish off, Simon, with whatever, whatever's on your mind. Yeah, well, I might just go back on everything I just said. <laughs> I, I really wish this was a seven-game series, mm. the way it's going right now. I don't want it to end in Tassie. I, I, I want to see this continue. But, yeah, I, I actually came prepared for the first time. Uh, normally when you say, oh, you, know, you get the last word, I'm like, oh, God, I think it's nothing. <laughs> I, I, want to, I want to tip the hat to, to, to Fab Krisovich mm. for his performance in, in game three. There, there's moments where you just sort of notice, well, he's obviously not a star of the Tassie Jack Jumpers. He's got a, a diminished role when they've got Magne healthy and up and about. And and I thought Marcus Lee was excellent early in the game. I thought his activity was far out. I thought he outworked JLA in the first four, five, six minutes of the game. But when Chris Lebitch came into the game, he came in and hit that kick out three. And then he's uh, got himself a layup in the pick and roll in the next possession. And you talk about guys who can impact in small moments. Like, he's played six minutes. Mm. He's got those back-to-back baskets, five points. And at the time, I took note. I was like, geez, that's a big 30 seconds from an unsung hero. And then when you see teams' ability to win on the buzzer, yep, we're going to focus on that. We're going to focus on the turnover, on the inbound. But I'm going to go back to that five points in 30 seconds, six minutes of brilliance, Plus seven, Fab Krislovich. I thought those are the those are the guys. When you come in and produce like that in minimal um, reps, 
those are the things that can win your championship. So I just wanted to tip my hat for, for him in his uh, unsung hero role in game three. Can you picture the first goal before the ball's even bounced? You might have the touch. When the weather's wet, can you feel who'll triumph? You've got the power. Can you read the footy future in the mullet of a full forward? Then you too might be harnessing the power of the touch. Got the touch? Download the Tab Touch app today. You win some, you lose more. For free and confidential support, call 1-800-858-858 or visit gamblinghelponline.org.au.